Welcome to church this morning, and before we get started, let's just pray. Father, we just, again, come before you this day, and we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you that as we gather here, we can be refreshed and renewed through your word, and even through the songs that we've sung. So, Lord, bless each one. Thank you for opening up our hearts and our minds to hear from you. And, uh, Lord, may this be a soothing aroma to you as we even just dive into your word. Pray this in Jesus' name, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, and this morning we're starting a brand new series. Um, but before we get into that, anyone remember what we talked about last week? <laughs> yeah, the blank faces, that's okay, no problem. We, we talked about um, where, where I believe God's setting us up to go as a church, all right? A place where we can provide hope and healing, a place where people can be accepted, messy lives can be accepted here, and that love would be the, the, the main focus of how people see us. But now, I talked about that in the sense of, hey, what about, it's, it's for the people in this community, it's for the people that don't know who Jesus is. But I want you to know, that's available for you here as well. We all need hope. We all need healing at some point in some area. And we all need to know that we're accepted in Christ. Amen? Amen? I kind of realized that after, like, hey, we're driving that, but I need you to know. You know, uh, do you remember the story I shared about Zacchaeus? And when, he, when Jesus called out to him, he, he was speaking his Hebrew name, Zacchaeus, meaning righteous one. Come down, I, I must stay at your house. You know what I neglected to say to you right there and then last week? Is that's how he sees you. Despite your, your, your actions, your words, the flaws that you have, he sees you as the righteous one. As the one that has no guilt, no shame. So in a sense, hear him calling you, hey, righteous one, come down. But he's the one who loves you. Anyways, I don't know why I need to say that, but I need to say that. Um, so we had a good time last week. This week, we're starting a brand new series, and it is called, I put it on, I swear. Oh, there you go. When God's grace abounds, there is dot, dot, dot. So we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at what is there when his grace, God's grace, abounds? If you notice the songs that we've sung, hey, great job, worship team. Thank you for speaking and singing about songs of grace. Um, something that has come across in my understanding that we've been talking about, even through our worship teams, is the fact that even the songs that we sing, there are tons of Christian songs out there, but the songs that we sing when we gather here together corporately, they ought to be speaking of his goodness, of his grace, of his finished work. And when we preach, the word that goes forth ought to be the same. When you look through the Bible and there's moments where people are sacrificing to the Lord, they'll build an altar and they'll sacrifice. And there are times where you'll see, hey, it was a sweet smelling aroma. It was a soothing aroma to the Lord. The sacrifice that's being put out is a picture of his son. It's speaking of his son. And so when we gather, we ought to be speaking about him and hearing about him and worshiping about him and what he has done at the cross. And that becomes a pleasing, soothing aroma to him. Amen? Sunday mornings ought to be about that. But that being said, today for the there is, we're going to be looking at forgiveness. You know, you might be thinking, well, Ray, that's, that's kind of something I already know. That's okay. <laughs> we, this is something we need to hear all the time. Okay? But before we get into that... I want to show you a verse here. Oh, before we get into... All right, let's go back. I should establish with you, what is God's grace? You've heard the term. You might think it's a, it's a subject to be taught on. It's something that you learn at Bible school. It's, it's a, yeah, a teaching of some sort. But what is God's grace? It is where God um, blesses you and heals you, delivers you because of what Jesus has done. Another definition is God's grace is his unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor that you have with him because of Jesus at the cross. 
You know, when I think of grace at times, uh, I was just telling my wife about this. She, we did the evangelism explosion back in the day, and we were at York University campus, and this guy was teaching us about, hey, sharing the gospel with people, right? <laughs> It was, it was a dreadful time. <laughs> it was hard. Because <laughs> I was afraid, all right, to walk up to nat people naturally unknown to me. But now my daughter will tell you, I do it all the time at the gas station, <laughs> just pumping gas, talking to the person. But that being said, this person that was doing the training shared this story. Now, I'm not saying I remember all the details, but it was to the effect of this. There was some sort of village, and, and, and uh, this young man was the chief of this village. And something was happening along the lines where food was, getting, food was getting scarce. So they had to start rationing and they had to start putting rules in place and whatnot. But then there was a moment where people are starting to notice, uh-oh, stealing is happening. Food's going missing. And so then they started to put out, okay, well, when we catch this person, we have to make them an example. So that everyone knows, if you're going to steal, you're going to be in big trouble. And so time went on after a couple of days and they caught the culprit. They caught the culprit red-handed. It was the chief's mom. Uh-oh, what do you do? He's at a crossroads here. He either upholds the law that they just made about making an example of the person. And so the law was that whoever gets caught would have to then be whipped. And that everyone would be watching and seeing this humiliation and this person would be hurt. So what does he do? He's the chief, right? He can't go back on his word. So he says, okay, put her on the whipping post. What? Are you serious? It's your own mom. And right there, he says, okay, commence the whipping. But right before they do, he goes and wraps his arms around his mom. And he takes the beating. That is a picture of grace. Getting the good that you don't deserve. You see that? Getting the good that you don't deserve. And when we sing about God's grace, it's everything about what he has done to take away the punishment that belongs to us. For our sins, for our messes, our mistakes. But yet he's the one who comes. Jesus comes and says, I will take your punishment. And he did it to its fullest. He absorbed it all. The full wrath of God. Something that we could not bear. But does it end there? No. There's great hope because he rose from the grave. He conquered death. Amen? Amen. So this is a picture of grace. And the Bible talks about his grace abounding more and more. That we need an abundance of it. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but so go to that verse here. John 1, 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We talk about grace, but I should establish here the difference between law and grace. You, you go through the book of Romans and you'll hear, you'll see, you'll read about Paul talking about this. Back and forth, back and forth. But pay attention to this verse. For the law was given through Moses. Who is Moses? A servant. The law was given through a servant. But grace and truth, notice grace and truth is on another side, and it came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through the Son. And the fact that the word came is that he came, meaning it's intimate. I'm here. I'm present. When you give something to, to a servant, you can give it from far away. It doesn't matter. But the fact that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law, what is the law? It's what, it's what God demands for, for, for you to be holy and whatnot. It's the rules, the do's and the don'ts. Now, I'm not saying that the law is bad. The law demands from you this type of right standing, this, this type of performance that you can't provide. But grace comes and supplies what you need. 
Does that make sense thus far? The law basically says, if you want to be this type of uh, Christian, if you want to put it this way, you want to be this type of Christian, you got to do all these things. But I want to tell you, the law can't make you holy, but it tells you this is what you have to do to be holy, but it can't make you. It doesn't bend. But God's grace says, I know you can't do it. No one can. And that's why I came. That's why Jesus came, so that he would fulfill the whole law. And then the fact that we are found in him. Okay, long grace, long grace. It leads us to this next verse. And this has been a verse that, um, can I say, revolutionized my life. For by one man's offense, death reigned through that one. Who's the one man that produced death? What's that one man's offense? It's, it's, it's speaking about this man named Adam. He was created to be the representative of God. And the one thing, one thing that he wasn't supposed to do, and this, the cunning serpent comes. The devil comes in the form of a serpent, and he comes and entices, and that's a whole different, the whole story is there. But it's the fact that he did it. It was high treason. He gave his authority that he had, the dominion over this earth, and as Adam ate of this fruit, it says his eyes were opened. This glory that he had, this glorious relationship that he had was severed. It's through his offense that death and sin just plunged the whole human race into it. That's what we call this separation from God. It's because of that one moment that everything changed. Everything changed. But then it says, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Jesus Christ. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. We're talking about grace here, and, and, and it might be some, something that you've thought about as, oh, well, it's, it's just this thing that I've learned about when I was a child. And it's this thing that's just in the back of my mind, but that's great. We need to learn about other stuff. No, the Bible's saying, much more those who receive an abundance of this grace and the gift of righteousness will reign, will reign in life. When you reign, what does that mean? That means you're above. That means you're on top. When you reign, you're leading. You'll reign in life, folks. Is, life not where, uh, is your life not where you want it to be at this point? Are there things that are plaguing you, that are, 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 are bringing you down, causing some sort of condemnation of some sort, causing problems, then that's not a picture of you reigning in life, is it? But yet the Bible says that you ought to be reigning in life through Christ, through the one, Jesus Christ. But it comes from a receiving an abundance of his grace. How do you receive an abundance of his grace? The grace that I'm talking about is a picture of forgiveness. So I've already said it, we've already sung about it, but I need to talk to you about this. I believe this is gonna be the foundation that we continue to build as we move forward. Because like I said, hope isn't just for the unbelievers. Hope is for each and every one of us. And our hope is found in Christ, and it's through this grace that he provides. The abundance of grace is the fact that your sins are all forgiven. Your sins are all forgiven. Do you believe it? So, as we do believe it, I believe sometimes we mix up the law and grace. This idea that I do believe I'm forgiven, but how does that play out in our actions, in our thoughts? Think about this for a moment. 
We get a great time on a Sunday. We hear the word. We're strengthened. We're revitalized. We know that we're forgiven. And that we go out Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, and so on and so forth. Maybe it's you driving on the road. I love this example because it happens to me, well, not all the time. I shouldn't say all the time. I am redeemed. I'm a work in progress. But yesterday, I get it, there's a snowstorm. But man, people drive slow. <laughs> I got slow tires for a reason. <laughs> come on. <laughs> and people always make these Chinese jokes. It's like, hey, come on, man. <laughs> I can drive good. <laughs> oh, you like that. You like that. But it's in these moments where all of a sudden it's like, God, what did I do to deserve all these slow drivers? <laughs> What's going on? But in reality, there's one common denominator, right? It's me. <laughs> so maybe there's something there. But what I'm trying to say is we do good on Sundays, but then all of a sudden Monday morning comes. Something happens. You do something that's, or, or something is given to you, or bad reports given to you, or, or, or the fact that you go out there and, and, yeah, maybe you do get angry and you blow your cool. And, and you, you, I mean, you, you, you lose your cool. Sorry, that's it. You lose your cool. And then you start to feel bad. You start to feel guilty. It's in that moment. It's in those moments when we mess up, when we do something that's wrong, that's not good for you, that may be hurtful. What do you do with that feeling? Do you know what I'm talking about? That feeling of guilt and shame, this condemning thought that just keeps nagging at you. Sometimes your mental eye, your mental movie player in your mind will replay those incidents over and over and over again. It's in those moments that you feel like garbage. And that is where what I'm trying to get across to you comes into play. It's in those very moments that we feel ashamed and guilty. That do you believe that you are forgiven? That you are still righteous? See, it's the abundance of grace and this gift of righteousness. You being right with God has nothing to do with what you've done. Because if it would be, then we wouldn't need Jesus. Correct? Jesus went on that cross to pay for our penalty for our sins so that we could be made right with him, be part of his family, to be in right relationship. But if we mess up tomorrow morning, whatever it may be, and you start to feel condemned and saying, uh-oh, I did something wrong. God, I messed up. Do you stay there? That's the question. What I'm saying is no. You should not stay there. Because in the midst of that, you are still righteous. You are still right with God. This is the grace that he's given to us. Why can I say that? How can I say that, Raymond? That's what you're asking me. I just called myself Raymond. <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> oh, here's a verse for you. I'll get back to my thought. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. It's through his blood, the shedding of his blood, that we have forgiveness. Okay? That's why when we partake in communion, we say, thank you, Jesus, when we hold the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood of the new covenant, for it's the remission of sins. And it's all according to his grace. But here, let me share with you. When God, Paul wrote this in Hebrews, when God set forth a new covenant, he says, a new covenant I'm giving to you. This is what he says. Because the old covenant, the law, the old covenant of the law said, I will remember your sins down to the third and fourth generation. I will keep remembering your sins is what God says. Okay? And, and for them to have, uh, back then in the Old Testament, for them to have some sort of covering for their sins, to make an atonement, what did they have to do? Do you remember? Do you know? We, we will do a whole series on this, maybe. But they needed to sacrifice an animal. An unblemished, perfect animal. Right? And then they would have to release its blood and whatnot. 
and then there was a transference that happened, right? The righteousness from this animal would be transferred to the person who's offering, and all the, uh, all the sin would be, in a sense, transferred into the animal. But God says this only covered. It never knocked it out. It never eradicated the sin. It just covered. That's why they had to continually give sacrifices. Okay? But God makes a new covenant with man. Hebrews chapter 8, starting from verse 8. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. For this is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I think I have this verse. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Do you see that? Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Folks, do you believe the word? Yeah, the answer is yes, you should. <laughs> but like I said, it plays out differently in your actions, does it not? When we mess up, when we feel guilty, do we believe that he doesn't remember our sins? That he forgives us? There's a war that happens. And so why did I say Romans 5.17 revolutionized my life over a decade ago? It's because in that moment, the realization came. Lord, even when I fail, even when I sin, you still see me as your son? Or you can say it as see, see me as your daughter? How is that possible? Why is that possible? Because this is why we talk about Jesus going on the cross. That is why Jesus absorbed all the sin of the world. Why John says, behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul says in Romans that he died once for all sin. How is that possible for past, present, and future sins? Listen, anyone here 2,000 years old? I didn't think so. All your sins were future when Jesus died on that cross. You weren't even a thought yet. But he already paid the price. It's already been done. Wait a second, Ray. Are you saying that even when I fail, I can still be right with him? That I'm forgiven? I can, I can hear your thinking. Wait, that means I can just go and do whatever I want? I've just got my free pass. Pastor Ray said it. No, I did not say that. Don't, don't mis, misinterpret that, okay? But first I need to establish the fact that your sins are forgiven. There's nothing that will ever change that. You are forgiven and free. But what happens... Ray, with all that stuff that I do. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect. This idea of being, being more like Christ is a journey that happens throughout your life. But what is true in the moment when you said, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Right there and then, you've been made righteous in an instant. And nothing to do with you. All about what Jesus has done. Okay, now let's address this. Wait a second, so I, I can just do what I want? No. No, you can't. But it's not about another law for you to perform. Jesus said this of this woman who came into Simon the Pharisee's house and it's nonstop she was just crying at his feet and wiping his feet with his hair, okay? Uh, Luke chapter 7, I don't have that verse for you on the screen, but 
This is what Jesus says. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed me with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. This is a beautiful picture. This is a beautiful picture of how God sees this. He gives you this gift of no condemnation, this gift of grace. But this lady, who, who they say, even Simon the Pharisee said, do you know who this lady is? She is such a big sinner, essentially, is what he was saying. But Jesus said, because she knows she's forgiven much, she loves much. Because she knows she's forgiven much, she loves much. This is why the abundance of grace needs to come out. It needs to come out so strongly. Because everyone talks about, hey, I gotta love the Lord. You wanna love him much? You gotta know that you're forgiven much. That's why when he says, when you're forgiven little, you will love little. But there is no such creature that is forgiven little. We all have been forgiven much. Whether you know him or not, whether you've accepted him or not. It's the ones that think that we're not forgiven much that will love little. See, it's in our understanding. So, well, like I said, let's go back. When we fail and we think, uh-oh, I messed up here. Or, okay, let, let, let's put it this way. You get a flat tire while you're driving. Sometimes this thought will cross your mind. God, what did I do to deserve this? Anyone ever think that? In any type of situation? Doesn't have to be a flat tire? God, what did I do to deserve this? That's the mentality that happens when we think that, uh oh, it's about my performance, about what I can do for God that determines that I'm getting this bad reward. No. Guys, we live in a fallen world with the enemies out there. <laughs> Trust me, I know you can't see it, neither can I, but I know this much, okay? When we walk around there, when we walk into this world, everywhere we go, we're a shining beam of light. We're in the kingdom of light. We stand out. Oh, enemy definitely wants to attack you. <laughs> yeah, he sure does. But you don't even have to worry about that stuff because God also gives you protection in his word, amen? I don't know what you may be going through. Psalm 91. Read it and memorize it. There's protection. I just saw a news article last night. Uh oh, there's some sort of SARS 2.0 coming out of China. And so air airports are starting to put stronger screenings and stuff in. What? Psalm 91 talks about pestilences that you can't even see. Hey, read it. Okay. That was a side tangent. But going back to this, it's in this moment that we need to recognize I am still good with him. The enemy may try to attack and make me think, oh man, what did I do to deserve this? Or better yet, what happens if it's a situation where I willfully messed up? What happens? Is there forgiveness for me there too? The answer is yes, there is, there is, but, now I'm not saying you can't go to God, go to him, talk to him, tell him you're sorry, it's okay, what, what's the word there, confess, it's oh, no problem, have that conversation with him, but even while you have that conversation, I want you to know, it comes from the fact that I am already forgiven. I don't confess to him to get forgiveness, no. In a couple weeks, maybe we'll touch upon that verse. Oh man, God's revealing so many things about that. Mm -mm. The fact that you're, you are righteous with God, you're right standing with God, is solid and firm and nothing's gonna ever change it. Okay, amen? 
I kind of lost my track of thinking there. But anyways, we instances may happen and we start to question God. There you go. We start to question, what did I do? It has nothing about that. It has nothing about what you've done. Enemy is attacking. Let it be. Nine times out of ten, those delays that you have in life, hey, it's for the better. You don't understand how many times we're, man, I am so annoyed with this slow driver in front of me. But then an accident is actually not far. Whoa. That could have been me. There have been closer incidences. It could have been, but it wasn't. So sometimes these delays and stuff, it's for your good. So in any circumstance in life, praise the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Even when you're annoyed. That, that might be harder said than done, but that's okay. That's okay. So this woman who, who was weeping at his feet, she loved him much. Her actions showed it because she knew she was forgiven much. Okay? But now, sometimes we talk about your Christian character. Hey, you got to be, you got to have self-control. You got to be uh, uh, more, you, more, you got to have brotherly kindness, sisterly kindness. You got to have all these things that exemplify the fact that you are a believer. And so from, from the past, pulpits will tell you, okay, these are what you should be and have. How do you achieve that? How do you obtain it? Sometimes they'll say discipline. Discipline is the key. Anyone ever hear that? It's all about your discipline. The more the Bible you read, the better you are, the closer you are to Jesus, the more you can become like him. I, I do agree with that, the latter half. But if it becomes, the, what I mean by that is the, the law of, no, you have to do this to become this. No, it's not about that. Again, it's not about your performance. So, that being said, you can turn with me to 2 Peter. Forgiveness not only sets how you see yourself in the conversations you have with God, but it, the forgiveness of Christ affects even how you live. Second Peter chapter 1, verse, starting in verse 5. Add to your faith a virtue, and to virtue knowledge. To knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get this now. Oh. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he, has been, he was cleansed from his old sins. You want to live this life with good Christian character? To represent him well? It doesn't come with because of what you do or don't do. It comes as the source, the fact that I am forgiven. That my sins have all been forgiven. And I know you might be thinking old sins, like in the past, before I became a Christian. No. For all your life. Even the thought you're thinking now, who is this crazy Pastor Ray talking to me right now? That's a negative thought, no worries. God's forgiven you. It's okay. I think the last time I talked to you, why is his hair always pointy? You like, I changed it for you, huh? <laughs> it's not as pointy anymore. But this is the beauty of knowing that you're forgiven. It sets us right so that we can have that relationship with him. And even in the midst of circumstances, we still know, even the one, if we're the ones who are at fault, we still know that we're right with him. And the way we live to represent him in our relationships to each other and to those out in the world, it all based, it's all based on our forgiveness, knowing that we're forgiven in Christ. Amen? Uh, uh, there's a verse... Um, that I remember looking at in Romans. Just reading again, and it just stood out. Uh, I'm going to find it right here. Romans, chapter 1, uh, verse 17. For it is the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. You receive that righteousness by faith, right? I said before, it's a gift. Do, do you work for a gift? Do you earn it? Can you pay for it? No. A gift is a gift. It's free. No strings attached. You receive it. So you receive it by faith and you live it out by faith. From faith to faith. Amen? And you live it out by saying, even in the midst of your failures, Jesus, I thank you that I am still righteous in your sight. And you go on in your day. But Ray, these things are plaguing me. Hey, you have a sound mind. You have the mind of Christ. Don't give the enemy the foothold to think about these things. It's forgiven. It gets better over time. <laughs> That's all I can say. But you can definitely let him know. Let it out of your heart. Tell him what you're feeling and sensing and experiencing. But know that it, you're always right with him. You're forgiven and free. Amen? Worship team, you can come on up. This is where hope is birthed. This is where hope is rooted. That the fact that I have hope in Christ because of all this, no matter what my past failures were, I can still walk as a child of God. Don't worry, this isn't the only sermon about this. We're going to keep diving into this. There's so much more that I want to say, but we're going to call it there for today, okay? Now, I don't want to miss this opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus into your heart. Maybe you're hearing about this and you're saying, that is what I want, to be able to live with him freely. I'm going to simply ask you to all just bow your heads. And if you've never had Jesus come into your heart, you can simply pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus who took all of my sin and shame into his own body and who went on hit the cross, who laid down his life on the cross to bear the full punishment for all my sin. I thank you, Jesus, for washing me clean and making me new. Thank you for being my Lord and Savior. Thank you that you can, you're walking with me every step of the way. That even when I fail, I thank you that you're right there with me. Thank you for loving me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's your first time praying that prayer, come talk with me. Come talk with me. But now for the rest of you, this isn't new, but it's meant to be true. It's meant to be true in our lives and have that lived out, all right? Father, thank you so much for each one here. Lord, with the words that have just been spoken, I thank you, Lord, that you're, you're producing something in their lives. That, Lord, we would understand fresh and anew your grace, your love, your forgiveness. As we go forth in this week, may you be with us and speak to us in all situations. And reveal afresh that we're forgiven and free in you, Jesus. Thank you for each one. In Jesus' name. Amen.